I want to pick up on what some of Rosie's just said, Grace, and that is that just because you've shared what's happened to you today or even 100 days doesn't mean you feel like doing it the next day, right? Mm -hmm. And I recognise the irony of then asking you about it, but how, do you, how have you managed the, the right that the media, that politicians, even community members like us sometimes feel they have to ask you questions on a day when you might be like, oh, I've said that. I don't want to do it today. Uh, sometimes I don't, to be honest with you. Um, because, and so I've been trying to have this discussion all year um, about how intentionally or otherwise um, the agents of the systems and institutions designed to protect us, whether that be the police or the courts or the media, often um, recreate uh, or mimic the behaviour patterns of predators, wherein... <laughs> You know, wherein they uh, are the ones holding all of the, the, the power, you know. And, um, for example, um, when I made my statement to police, um, you know, and, and, and part of this is a failing of our education system and why I'm so focused on prevention. Um, you know, it's a complex subject like grooming, which are mirrors coercive control, I suppose, in the domestic violence spaces. You know, we, um, it's a very complex subject. I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent, but I promise you I will go back. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, when, we, when we're, uh, say, um, you know, stabbed, we have the um, language to explain what happened to us, um, and then also um, the uh, language and the, the tools to seek appropriate help afterwards. But children, by virtue of their age, don't have the mental framework to actually understand all the complex layers of psychological manipulation. So also, even though I actually decided to report to police, so I knew on some level that what had happened to me was categorically wrong. I didn't know how wrong, and I couldn't actually compartmentalise all those layers. I didn't know about isolation. I didn't know about the, the careful eroding of the boundaries. Um, you know, I didn't know about the maintaining control. I, couldn't, I didn't have the language to, to explain all of these different things. And so I was still very confused and I was still very worried about getting into trouble um, because I did know that I participated in the lying and the covering up and this aspect of conspiracy. So I did feel very much like it was my fault. Um, and the police officer, and um, actually the way that the, the statement, um, the, the circumstances in which the statement was made did very much reinforce that dynamic. I made the statement to a man who was twice my size, very much like the pedophile who was six foot two and 58 years old when I was 15. Um, and most of it occurred in a small room when I was on, the back, on my back on the floor. And here I am and on a Saturday night in this tiny little shoebox of a room. My parents are in the other room. I didn't have a support person. And there's this man asking me questions. And every time I described one of the incidents of rape, he stopped me and he said, and by rape, do you mean he put his penis into your vagina? and I had to stop and I had to qualify every incident of rape and that trips you up and it makes you think and it makes you go into the self-doubt and the guilt and the shame and that's another example of it. And then how about we go into the media? Last year, every time you're sort of briefed on where the topic will go, where the conversation will go, and of course, people like David Koch love to throw you under the bus because, hey, how fun is it to talk about politics randomly on morning TV for a bit of ratings in the morning, you know? Um, and then there's all of these other examples, or the courts. Um, putting children um, on the stand to cross-examine them. Um, children who don't understand, again, these complex subjects. That's another example. Um, or 
How about the, the law that in Tasmania, the Let Her Speak campaign had to campaign to change, that archaic law? Or all these other examples of, of gaslighting, the Grace Tame Foundation, um, which we set up to pursue both um, structural change and cultural change. We've currently just launched a campaign which is called Stop Gaslighting Survivors because currently, in six jurisdictions still, the crime of persistent child sexual abuse is still called maintaining a sexual relationship with a child. Mm. And because my perpetrator, who <laughs> actually abused several girls before me, and I talked about this at the National Press Club, but I, I don't expect that people watch all of the speeches that I make, but... but <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 do, I do try to, to make this point quite a lot. Um, he was, not only was he found with 28 multimedia files of child abuse material, including nine files of videos of adults raping children, he was also found with a trophy file of all of the girls that he collected from 1992 until 2011. And guess what? All of the girls had something in common. They were like me. I came from a broken home. My parents were separated when I was one. Um, and that's one of the things. They look for particularly vulnerable children who are easy targets, who are already isolated or in need of, 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 of something um, and some more emotional support. They were all from rural families or broken homes. Um, you know, and he kept them on his computer, kept all these girls, you know? But he was convicted, not of persistent child sexual abuse, he was convicted of maintaining a sexual relationship. And the media was then able, they had actually official license to romanticise abuse. And this is how our victim blaming culture is not just a culture, it's actually codified into our society, it's actually entrenched in our systems. They were able to romanticise abuse, and the first headline that came out that reported on my case, and I read this when I was 16, was teacher admits to affair with student. Mm. So there you go. And again, I've gone off on a massive tangent. <laughs> but I come back, and you were talking about the media <laughs> and their right. <laughs> And how do I know and how do I manage? And the answer is, sometimes I don't. And sometimes, you know, and if it weren't for Max Heary, my now fiancé, I probably wouldn't be alive. And you know what? I'm going to be honest about something. And the media will probably grab hold of this and they might write something really trashy about it. And you know what? I will wear it because I want a lot of crap this year and I own it. And I like to be a few steps ahead and maybe specifically eight years ahead of the Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was actually in the ER the other day because I felt... I, I actually lost control, and I, I was really scared. And I called, up, I called up the clinic, and I just said, I just can't, I can't. I've, I've stepped too deep into the shame spiral, and I'm thinking about killing myself. And that's real. That's the toll it takes. That's the price of shame. And so that's why I wrote that open letter. You know, I've got a sense of humour, and I can, I can say, you know, take me to the April sun in Cuba, baby, <laughs> and have a laugh. But the media has a lot to answer for. In where it directs its shame, there is a disproportionate amount of shame that is still pointed towards people who do not understand yet what has happened to them. And that shame needs to be pointed squarely, completely, not at these people, who are trying to figure out what the f happened to them, it needs to be pointed at the perpetrators of domestic violence, of sexual assault and child sexual abuse. That is where it needs to be pointed.